Welcome back, guys. Here's chapter 11.2, lesson number four. Um, taking a look at the examples and this use of calorimetry to make inferences about a chemical reaction using the heating up or cooling down of the surroundings or the water or solutions in your calorimeter and the MC delta T stuff that we had learned back in uh, science 10. So here's just a graph kind of showing what we were looking at here. So if I start with a whole bunch of energy in my chemical reaction, and as the reaction progresses, I find I have lost energy. All right, I have this decrease in the energy of my system. Then that energy must go somewhere. And so the calorimeter is specifically designed to give you or give the reaction somewhere to put that lost energy. And so the surroundings or the water that makes up the solution in your calorimeter would start at a low temperature. And as the energy is lost by the reaction, it goes into the water, increasing its energy, the thermal energy that it would have. And we would see a temperature increase and higher particle motion. And so you'll notice that these two bundles of energy or this change in energy that we see between the two, all right, is the same, it's just that as one has gone down, the other one has gone up. And so we use our integers for that one of negative and positive to show the different direction. Okay, so I hope that graph helps make sense of the assumption uh, that we just made in which your thermal energy changes that we have are equal to the enthalpy changes for your reaction, but one has to be negative because as one increases, the other one decreases. So it doesn't really matter where it goes. I tend to put it on the, um, on the Q most times, all right, but however you like to work it. So let's take a look at some of these examples and see if it uh, hammers the point home for you guys. Here we have a container of methane that is burned, and this combustion of methane is being used to heat up 500 mils of water in a calorimeter. The water in the calorimeter increases from 25 degrees C to 87.6. I want to know what is the enthalpy change because of the combustion reaction of methane. So I am trying to figure out the combustion enthalpy for methane based upon the thermal changes that I see within my water. And so as one goes up, the other one must go down. I don't know which one is which yet, so I just put my negative in there to help me out. I also try with my enthalpy changes or my delta H calculations to put in the type of reaction that it is related to. And so a subscript usually goes in to talk about the particular reaction that's going on. So this is the delta H for the combustion of methane, which would be different, let's say, than for the formation of methane or the decomposition of methane or, uh, let's say, a... Uh, oh, I don't know, uh, some sort of generic reaction involving methane, all right, maybe the chlorination of or something like that. So different reactions will have different enthalpy changes for the same substance. So we do try to be specific here. All right, so delta H is equal and opposite to Q, but we do get to make an assumption again here where Q can be found as the MC delta T for my surroundings in the calorimeter. So I can use the information from my calorimeter to learn about the energy changes of the reaction. So... Combustion enthalpy for methane is just equal to negative mc delta t, the negative because I put it in there because of this stuff up here. And so I just need to know what's heating up or cooling down. From the question, I can see that it is 500 grams of water. All right, because it's water, it has its 4.19 joule per gram degree C value for specific heat capacity. And I have a heating up of water, so it finishes at 87.6 and started at 25.0 degrees C. Run that through your trusty TI calculator there. And so it's 500 times 4.19 times the difference between 87.6 and 25. And that works out to 131,147 joules. For this, we needed an answer in kilojoules, so I'm going to move my decimal place three spots just to reflect that a kilojoule is a thousand times larger than a joule. All right, so that now gives me 
negative 131.147 kilojoules. I do have to correct this to my three sig dig limit that I saw from the numbers that were used here. And so there's my three digits. The one rounds down. And so I do get to finally state that the combustion enthalpy for uh, methane is negative 131 kilojoules in this particular reaction. So why the negative here? Well, the negative makes sense. We said that exothermic reactions should have a loss of enthalpy or a loss of uh, chemical energy as they go through the reactions. And so the negative does reflect that for us as we see the delta H. The positive was for our Q because it did heat up. All right, and so the equal and opposite nature here of this formula that we've made, all right, based upon how a calorimeter works, tells us that the combustion enthalpy for this container of methane worked out to 131 kilojoules lost. All right, so we have an exothermic reaction, which makes sense for combustion reactions. Okay, here's another one. 50 mils of a 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide solution and 50 mils of a 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid solution each at 20 degrees are mixed in a calorimeter. All right, so we're running a neutralization reaction here. All chemical reactions should show an enthalpy change. And so we want to try and figure out here, is this uh, neutralization an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction? And how much? So, all right, what kilojoules uh, enthalpy change do we have here? So we're looking for the delta H or enthalpy change here for the neutralization reaction based upon the measurements we can make in our calorimeter of heating up or cooling down. So we can make that equal to negative Q. We already know that we can extend this to MC delta T. We just have to know what we have heating up or cooling down in our calorimeter. And so I have 50 mils of base solution. I have 50 mils of acid solution. So I actually have a total of 100 mils of solution in my calorimeter when I run this reaction. And so that works out to uh, 100 grams of solution or surroundings. Hope that made sense. We are dealing with fairly dilute solutions, and so we did have another assumption that the solutions, unless you were told otherwise, get to be treated like water. And so the specific heat capacity for your uh, acid solution and your base solution would be 4.19 joules per gram degree C. And then we have the temperature change. It says we started at 20, we finished at 35.6, so final minus initial gives us our temperature change with the correct integer. Run that through your calculator, we have 15.6 for our temperature change times 4.19 times 100, and we end up with 6,000, oops, 536.4. That would be joules all right, of energy lost by this neutralization reaction. Should put this into kilojoules. So again, I'll move my decimal three spots because the kilojoule is that much bigger. I will do my rounding to three digits. And so the final answer here is 6.54 kilojoules. Okay. Hope that makes sense to you guys, and uh, this one is making sense to you. Got a couple more examples uh, to do here. All right, for the third one here, again, we have some very similar uh, information to what we had in question number two, so I'll just give you that answer. You guys can try that one on your own. And so we have, for this one, you should have 2.35 kilojoules if you do it correctly when you try it on your own. And then we have one here that is a little bit more lab-like, so you gotta decipher some information as we go through it. A student conducts an experiment on a silicone cube uh, and a calorimeter. She, can, uh, she collects the following data. Her calorimeter is made out of aluminum and it weighs 470.0 grams. The mass of water that she has in it is 100 uh, grams because she put 100 mils of water in there. The initial temperature of her calorimeter water is 23 degrees. The mass of the silicone cube that she drops into the water is 52.0 uh, grams. And the temperature of our silicon starts at 61, but the system 
finishes at 24.6. Lots and lots of numbers here. We are looking for the amount of energy lost by the silicon in the experiment. Okay, well, this isn't really showing us any sort of chemical reaction here. We're just plunking a cube of silicon into some water. So in this case, we have the Q for the silicon being equal and opposite to the Q for the water. Okay, so we just have two things heating up or cooling down rather than an endo or exothermic reaction causing the heating up or cooling down. So, all right, we are looking for Q silicon based upon what we see for what's happening to the water. And so, uh, in this case here, we should uh, take a look at one other thing. We have been given information on the calorimeter itself. And so, not only is it the water that's heating up or cooling down, it is also the aluminum. So, the takeaway for this particular question here is, while in most cases we ignore the calorimeter itself because the loss is given for uh, the lid, the thermometer, the calorimeter container and stuff like that is usually so small it's safe to ignore. If a question, especially on the diploma exam guys, if a question does tell you the amount of calorimeter material or gets specific about the thermometer or the lid and all the other parts, you must account for them. All right, we usually just ignore our, everything else. All right, and we'll see this in a lab uh, later on and a lab question. But if your calorimeter is described specifically with specific materials and specific amounts, then the question is trying to tell you, you can't ignore this. So the Q changes for our silicon will be the sum of all of the other Q changes uh, related to this calorimeter. So that gives us our negative here. For the water, it's just MC delta T for the water plus the MC delta T for the aluminum. Put this in here, and so we had 100.0 grams of water times the 4.19 joule per gram degree C value for it, times the temperature change. Uh, we started off with, better get some more brackets in here, uh, 23 degrees and finished at 24.6. All right, so 24 point, oops, 24.6 minus 23.0 degrees C. All right, and we had some information for our aluminum. And so you can see that we also have, oh man, I'm having a real hard time with my decimal places, 470.0 grams of aluminum. Okay, on your data sheet, uh, aluminum is, oh darn it, hold on, just let me pause this. All right, so on our data sheet, we look up our aluminum. You can see the specific heat capacity for aluminum, 0.897 joules per gram degree C. So we add that to our solution, 0 0.897 joules per gram degree C. And of course, we also have our uh, temperature change for the aluminum. I would assume here, all right, that uh, with the water in the aluminum, they would have started at the same temperature and they finish here at 24.6. Minus the 23 start. Sorry, guys, I ran myself out of room there. Okay, and we'll just run this through our calculator. And so, as we uh, finish this one off here, what was the thermal energy that was gained by the water? It's 100 times 4.19 times that 1.6 degree temperature increase. And so, we have that. And so... That's 670.4 joules. Plus, what did we get with our uh, aluminum here? We had a large aluminum container of 470 grams times 0.897 times that 1.6 degree temperature change. All right, and so we couldn't ignore it this time because we had 674.544 joules of energy uh, gained by the aluminum as well. So add those two numbers together, and so the uh, energy lost by our silicon 
All right has to equal to the energy gained by the aluminum and water. So we just add the 670 to the 674 here. And so we get 1,344.944 joules. Correct that to kilojoules by moving your decimal place three spots. And so we get negative 1.34 kilojoules of energy lost uh, by the silicone. Uh, I'm noticing that I do have a, a typo here. All right, the mass of silicon should not be in this problem. All right, to highlight the point that I have multiple Qs. So uh, I'll fix that for the notes on D2L so you won't see the 52 grams. Just ignore that it was here as you're going through the video. Uh, there you go, guys. So that's four calorimetry examples. Uh, please read 45 to 494. This is a huge, massive idea. We use calorimeters a ton as we go through thermochemistry. So make sure that you're getting uh, some practice in. Look at questions one and two on 494 and check your answers on D2L. Good luck with it, guys. See you in the next video.